So you were streaming somewhere else. Interesting. If anybody doesn't have a zine yet. Oh. Some, do some documentation may be out of date. <laughs> uh, do you want to update the basic oh, info? Sure. Um, Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay. Oops. All right. Uh, is there a save button or is it just do the thing? Oh. All right. Cool. Cool. So you are alive to the internet. Okay. And I will tweet out the slide. Thank you. Thank you for managing. And now I have to like code switch my brain back into whatever this was. Oh, that made it worse. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Still needs a little bit of, of tweaking. Um, I made it as an ICE logo. I'm also making us a CN logo. Oh. Because apparently this is how you decompress from writing a dissertation is I make <laughs> logos. It's a very surprisingly productive thing to do for a casual creator. <laughs> I also played like 45 straight hours of Stardew Valley, but... <laughs> oh, do we have Michael online? Is somebody... Um, uh, okay. As long as somebody is playing the Michael. You could have had a Michael puppet. <laughs> <laughs> he would have loved that. <laughs> <laughs> if Jared were here, he could do it with Adobe, right? <laughs> right. The character is his Michael. I, I would make a Michael puppet, but I would have a really hard time not putting on his like giant poof ponytail that he used to yeah. have. <laughs> oh, a sort of retro. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember that ponytail. All right. There you go. Good morning, Michael. Or I guess for you it's evening. Yeah. <laughs> One more thing. Oh, okay. Mid to late afternoon. All right, well, it sounds, sounds pleasant. So anyway, I'll sort of uh, do a quick pan of the room here so you can sort of see, you know, lots of people. Uh, actually, uh, oh, that is exciting. It's not using, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, my laptop is confused. It has two cameras to choose from, uh, and it chose poorly. So let me, let me do the settings. And video, yes, heck with integrated webcam, HD Pro webcam, there we go. Yeah. Okay, and no default microphone, HD Pro webcam microphone. All right, still hear me? Okay, all right, now here's the pan of the room, so wave to Michael, everyone. Hi, Michael. <laughs> we miss you. I should have brought the meeting up. All right, there we go. <laughs> But not too soon. All right. All right. So then let me kind of set you up here. Let's see. Trying to get both Kate and the screen in. Let's see how does that work. Yeah, there's also a YouTube video or like live stream if that's better quality for you. I also sent you my slides so you can, yeah, I sent you the slides so you can follow along at home. Cool. Let's see. There you go. And then let's see. Let me. Awesome I've tried that with um, user testing the video game. Alright, yeah. <laughs> there can be no real-time conversation. This way I get the, the immediate feedback of facial expressions, uh, so I can tell if my jokes don't land. <laughs> Just kidding, there are no jokes in this presentation. So you've already got like five people in your live chat? Cool. <laughs> yeah, we have some friends who are, are, are Skyping in from, from various locations who are not on my dissertation committee. All right, is everyone ready to start? Everybody got snacks? Um, I think I mean you'd like two more seconds for snacks. Yep. <laughs> we're, we're in no terrible rush. I guess England has one less hour of difference than usual. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's more true. fortuitous. That's for three weeks. That's You're a, gaining that on the backs of us all being exhausted, Michael. I'm just saying, you can probably take this opportunity to retweet the live stream. Like, like oh, <laughs> Mm. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Is retweeted. Sweet. Mm. <laughs> All right. 
phase. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that? So. <sighs> All right, well, I would like to thank everybody for, for coming out this early in the morning. Um, it means a lot to me to see all y'all here. Um, and thanks to my committee for joining in and for putting up with me in the past like eight <clears throat> years of, <laughs> of writing this dissertation. Um, so yeah, today I'll be presenting my talk on casual creators, um, defining a genre of autotelic creativity support systems. Uh, I, for, I keep forgetting to define autotelic in this presentation, uh, but autotelic means for its own purpose if people aren't familiar with that word. Um, so yeah, I'd like to start by asking the question, what are games? Uh, I'd like to like, coin the term games uh, to describe the type of software. Um, I'd like to propose some definitions of games. I'd like to describe some properties of games and game-like systems. Uh, I'd like to annotate a number of fields that have useful information for understanding games, uh, propose some initial genres of games, like RPGs, uh, list some game design patterns across multiple genres of games, uh, create a list of games, and then make some games of my own to find out what games are. This would be a fairly silly dissertation. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out that casual creators are actually, from as far as I can tell, about as big as games without have, ever having the sort of defined culture that we defined for games in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, so during this presentation, I'm going to give you some definitions of casual creators, talk about some properties, um, some other fields that have useful information, some genres, uh, design patterns, a list of them. Um, this is more in the dissertation itself, and also show you some casual creators that I made to figure out what it is. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about casual creators for those who aren't familiar with the term that I coined uh, probably in 2014, a little bit later. Are all of those casual creators? These are all casual creators. And are casual creators is a term to unpack that I will uh, talk about later. Um, so this is going to be a very quick presentation. Uh, I only have 40-ish 40, 40 minutes. Um, uh, my dissertation itself is about the length of Return of the King or Harry Potter or Sense and Sensibility, so there's a lot more in the dissertation that I would encourage you to read. Uh, it may be not as good a read as those, but there's a lot more information. Um, so getting to know casual creators. Uh, so this is kind of the outline of the talk that we're uh, going to look at today, and this is also the contributions to the dissertation. So like I said before, I'm going to define what it is. I'm going to discover a bunch of shared features from looking at these and then also uh, looking at my, or like making some of my own. And then um, my, one of my big contributions is that I'm going to ontologize these shared features. So how do we kind of create a tool belt for ourselves to think about what casual creators are? Um, these were my research questions. Um, this is a lot of kind of fluff, but uh, basically essentially what I said in the previous slide of what defines it, what new experiences do we get, um, how do we uh, predict those experiences through what we know of creativity um, and what do we need in order to understand and analyze them. So this is always kind of a dual focus of I want to build casual creators and I also want people to be able to analyze them. Um, and are there subcategories? What set of design patterns? And do these design patterns help? So keep those in mind as, as part of the evaluation. Um, so yeah, first let's define what a casual creator is. So a casual creator, this is this sort of informal definition just to get people on board. Um, it's, a, it's some form of interactive system. It has to be interactive in some way. It may or may not be digital. Uh, and it's going to scaffold the creative process with some set of restrictions or generative augmentation. So it's either going to confine you in some way or it's going to create some sort of automated mechanism to empower you. Um, I hate that word, to like increase your uh, abilities. Um, and that creates a generative possibility space. So there's going to be some possibility space of artifacts that we're creating. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is the pottery wheel. So if you think about sculpting clay normally, you can sculpt a very wide range of different shapes. Uh, there's still a, a possibility space of like you can't have blobs of clay floating in the air, um, but you can have a really wide range of space. A pottery wheel constricts that space a lot. So you can just really have a sort of curve that is rotationally extruded. Um, and you can have some, some variety of things within that space. But it also allows you to make things in that space very easily. You can make a smoother, more symmetrical pot than you could normally, uh, especially as a beginner. Um, there are plenty of apps. Uh, at, there's at least one really famous app uh, called Let's Create Pottery, which is one of the top App Store games, uh, which is just a pottery wheel. So this is a sort of digital representation of um, 
the pottery wheel. I would I would actually call both of these casual creators, uh, and both really for the same reasons that you are for an entertaining purpose, um, manipulating this poss like searching in this possibility space through like moving uh, the shape of the the curve in and out. Um, so the user is interactively exploring that possibility space. Um, and they are making or discovering artifacts in that space. And there's a kind of interesting distinction that I'll address later. And then one of the big things is they're exchanging control for power. I can't make everything and I can't have total control, um, but I'm getting some sort of power from that, either in this sort of like augmentation of, you know, it's making um, any stroke that I, I have, it makes it rotationally symmetrical. Um, but it's also saying like, well, you can't make, uh, especially in the app, you can't make something that would collapse on itself um, in the way that you could in a normal, or in a normal pottery wheel. Um, this is my official definition, which I won't read out, um, but it's really more about, um, so not ever, so um, the sort of key phrases to keep in your head of all this is a casual creator is interaction plus generativity, exploring a generative space, um, but not every interactive uh, generator is a casual creator. So we can think of something like LaTeX, where LaTeX is a, an interactive generative system. So it, it is augmenting and scaffolding my creativity, but I'm not using it autotelically. I'm not using it sort of, you don't sit down and have a nice afternoon with LaTeX. Um, Jim and, does with Griselda. He does. This is why is a casual creator is, is a questionable thing. For Jim, possibly Excel is a casual creator. But, um, but not with LaTeX, I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and also, it's not letting me sort of freely move through this possibility space. It's, it's very constraining. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't trigger all these nice creative moments. Um, one of the things about casual creators is when you do have this feeling of autotelically moving through a possibility space, you get all these sorts of nice uh, emergent behaviors. And so we saw this on Spore, where when, when people get creative, they want to share that creativity with others. We gave them message, uh, we gave them um, a way to upload objects and comment on those objects, but not a way to directly message each other. And so on the right, you see uh, they made mailbox objects, uploaded those, and used those as direct uh, messaging sites for particular users. And you can see that each mailbox is highly personalized. Um, this is the sort of emergent behavior that we see whenever a casual creator like really gets going. Not all of them get to this level, but this is a very strong sign of success. Uh, so the question is, so is this a casual creator? Is Excel a casual creator? Um, we can think about it like with this map, that there's some sort of nexus of true casual creators, and there's gold standard casual creators, and then there's like casual creators that are actually pretty rubbishy, but are still casual creators. And then there's stuff that could probably use more casual creator patterns, um, there's stuff with some properties of casual creators, and then there's things that are definitely not casual creators. Um, but I don't actually find this terribly helpful. It reminds me a lot of Jesper Ewell's um, heart of gameness diagram, where there is some true heart of gameness with possibly like chess at the very center, and then like moving out from there, there are not game things. And so where you put something like Proteus or the Spore Creature Creator is, is questionable on here. I find this actually um, a fairly unhelpful diagram, and it leads to a lot of like, well, is it or isn't it? Um, because one of the things that I've found with casual creators is that, especially possibly because it's not been defined as a space before, there are a lot of things kind of in this liminal region, things that could be a casual creator. Um, you know, if you make a game, you have a lot of people telling you what a game is, and so you are kind of constantly measuring against that and self-correcting to more gameness. Uh, we don't have that for casual creators, and so people who make these entities aren't necessarily moving towards more casual creativeness, or they don't even know how. And so you have systems like, um, my motivating example for this dissertation is the Spore Galactic Adventure Pack, where you could uh, create games using the Spore engine. Um, and it was a complete disaster compared to the really gold standard creature creator. Uh, we had very few um, artifacts that were made. The artifacts that were made were very poor quality. People did not even play their games for the most part. And so this was a system with casual create, like very clear casual creator intentions that failed as a casual creator experience. Um, there are also systems that lack the, the knowledge of the larger space, but identify a few key design patterns and end up as casual creator experiences anyway. Uh, but they're kind of only exploring a certain part of the space that they've identified. So Ken Stanley's group does a lot with uh, entertaining genetic algorithms. Um, and they really dialed in on what makes an entertaining genetic algorithm, but they're not exploring a lot of the other possible design patterns that might like combine really well with that. 
Um, and then the third one is the like sort of definitely not casual creators uh, bucket. Systems that people use and reinvent as casual creators or as part of a generative pipeline, which I'll talk about later. Uh, these are things like Dwarf Fortress where, um, or Minecraft. Uh, so Minecraft people have made casual creator elements in it, or they're using it often as the casual creator sort of self-promotion, uh, autotelic creativity thing. Um, and then Dwarf Fortress, which is clearly not a casual creator. Uh, it is not a casual anything. <laughs> um, but people have used the output of that and built casual creators around it. Uh, so this is one of those. This is the uh, Legends viewer, where you can take output of a Dwarf Fortress, um, like 6,000 year simulation, and then start editing it into a, a a fun story. So this is like, it's helping you write a novel dynamically with this generative space. Um, so what do we gain by defining casual creators? This is the sort of, what is the purpose of this dissertation? I, I've talked about the question that I'm answering, but why am I answering it? Um, there are a couple of things that I'd like to see happen with it. Um, it helps us compare common experiences across fields and disciplines. Uh, the image over here on the left is a little bit hard to see, um, but the one on the left is a choreography piece by animator Norman McLaren, where a human figure is uh, repeatedly um, overexposed on a piece of film. And then people made something remarkably similar to that with the Kinect, uh, and then as an art experiment, and then um, Happy Action Theater, which is a commercial game, did it as well. So we, here we have choreography, animation, um, sort of playful Burning Man art, and uh, commercial game, all making something that is very much the same experience and not talking to each other in any way. Um, and another thing that I'd like, oh, sorry, uh, I forgot the rest of that slide. Um, I want to give us a common language on slash ontology to talk about this so that we can go to people in other fields. Um, I'd really like for a game designer to be able to talk to somebody who does these little music apps and be able to like um, talk back and forth. Somebody like Adam Smith has uh, made a little music app, but I don't know if you talk to other music people while you made that, uh, which is, there's, there are a large number of little doodly uh, casual creator music apps, and I think that nobody is talking to those folks yet. Um, I also want, would love to have like a shared community, like what is our GDC of casual creators? Uh, could we even just have a workshop at, PC, or at uh, FDG or something like that? Uh, heck, could we have a mailing list? Um, and then one of my big ones is interventions in systems that want to be casual creators. Uh, and this has been fairly effective, um, both in my own work and in student work and in uh, contracting work. Um, I'd also kind of like to do a bit of a, uh, an intervention in the way that we talk about so-called trash apps. Um, there are a lot of apps uh, that are highly feminized in this space, and there's a history of highly feminized craft, uh, especially craft for non-commercial purposes, uh, the sort of uh, wasted activity um, that is used to occupy time. Um, and I won't go into that. There's a long history of interesting gender craft studies. Um, but we often disregard these apps. So you don't teach these in game design classes. You teach you know, chess and Mario, the true games. Um, <laughs> And so I would love to look more at, uh, the one on the right is Nintendo's canceled knitting uh, um, machine for the Nintendo, uh, which we didn't get. Uh, apparently there's, there's a nice quote by the person who said it was the least enthusiastic demo he ever gave. So thanks that guy. <laughs> um, but you know, can we, can we revisit some of this stuff and treat it with respect? This is how people spend their time. Um, I also think it's a really fun way to understand how we interact with generative spaces. I spend a lot of time with the computational creativity community. Um, they're very interested in making generators that make art. Uh, this makes these generators interactive, and so you can start exploring them in different ways. Um, so these are all sort of interesting generative spaces that you interact with in different ways. Uh, and again, these are all in some form or another casual creators, everything from paint by numbers to this sort of like giant ball covered in graphite that you like launch around an art space to things like KidPix. KidPix is like a very clear casual creator. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the previous work. Uh, so, um, cause I think I'm already running a little long. Um, so we've got interaction plus generativity. So we're gonna look at some frameworks of interaction and generativity, and then also talk about what we know about creativity. If, if, these, uh, are, if these systems are to support creativity, what do we know about creativity so that we can like build that in? Um, we know a lot about creativity. Uh, it's been pretty well uh, discarded, the idea of there's sort of like one creative mind. We've got a Beethoven and he's an addict somewhere. And as long as you've got an, a Beethoven and some like four walls around them, they will just continue to make work. 
uh, this is not thought to be true, and this is especially not thought to be true of casual creativity. So everybody in this room is creative, but also everybody outside of this room is creative. It's a natural human uh, activity. Um, so there are a couple of uh, different frameworks proposed of this, like Csikszentmihalyi's, um, uh, I think it's called DIFI, or uh, but domain, field, and individual. So that you have oil painting, you have a field of painting experts, and then you have yourself, and the sort of the interaction between myself, my activity, and the people evaluating me is, is where creativity comes from. Um, there's also things like embodied cognition, where creativity actually happens when I push my paint against a paint or a canvas, uh, or if you're writing a story and you feel your your characters start to push back against you. So this idea that like we are experiencing creativity through our tool. Um, and then there's a whole field of creativity support. Um, these can be things that about uh, preventing what suppresses creativity, so like preventing blank slates, um, and supporting what enables creativity, so uh, in, in, uh, encouraging divergent thinking. Um, Mad Libs, surprisingly, I, as I discovered in this dissertation, was actually made by two television writers who worked on The Odd Couple, uh, and they made it as a tool to help themselves come up with wackier comedy ideas. Uh, and then they released it, and it became something for non-professional comedy writers to use. Uh, I looked at a lot of generative frameworks. There are a massive number of frameworks of generativity out there. I have, uh, in one of these papers, somebody lists three pages of different uh, frameworks for generativity in fields across dance and architecture, etc. cetera. Um, these are just the ones that I looked at. So I looked at some for PCG and games. Um, I looked at some for generative art. I even looked at some for natural science uh, frameworks. There's a couple of very good books on how does nature produce pattern. Uh, and all of these kind of showed me that there are some things that I'm calling generative methods that are like sort of not universal, but reapplicable Lego bricks of generativity that get reused, everything from galactic formation to cellular formation um, to spiraling sheep horns and curly hair and grapevines. Um, and then there's a uh, work by uh, Heim Gingold called Magic Crayons, which is all about uh, how generative things can come to life and surprise you and a little bit about how to interact. Um, but a lot of those don't get into interactivity, uh, especially in this sort of how do we understand systems by interacting with them? So if I have some sort of strange generative toy, how do I understand what it's doing? Um, you know, if, if I have a pottery wheel and I've never seen one before and you sit me down at it and I see that there's a lump of clay spinning and I poke my finger into it and I see a line go all the way around it really quickly, I'm like learning what that system wants to do. Um, I was really delighted to find that everybody has loops. Um, I would just... Every paper that I read, or like maybe every third paper that I read would have a loop of some kind. Um, some of them cited each other's loops, but for the most part, no. Um, so over on the right is Steve Swink's game field. This is uh, how do you grab a muffin? You move your hand, and then as you are moving your hand, you're constantly like um, updating your mental model of how far your hand is from the muffin and how far you should move. Uh, so these are all um, kind of representations of I have some mental model, I am acting on some system, or like I have a mental model, I make a hypothesis, I encode that hypothesis into an action, the system responds to me, I look at that, I reevaluate it, and then I build it back into my mental model. Um, and the faster you go through this loop, the more you understand how a system works. Um, the two on the left are from, um, are specifically uh, identifying like this issue in software where encoding something into the system can actually be a pretty gnarly thing. These were all, um, uh, talking about why we shouldn't just use keyboards anymore. Uh, so what are other ways of encoding things in systems that are not, you know, making a punch card? Um, so nobody had actually named their loop for the most part. Um, there's kind of a reflection in action loop, but um, I needed some way to just talk about your loop is too slow. Uh, because a lot of these things, like the faster your loop goes, the better you're able to learn a system. And so if you have a complex system to learn and your loop is five minutes long, no one will ever learn it. If your loop is 30 milliseconds long, it just becomes intuitive. It's really uncanny how fast that works. Uh, and so this is what I'm calling the grab loop. Um, and basically it's a loop of um, smashing some reflection and action stuff into um, the uh, uh, Hutchins, Hollins, and Norman um, loop. Basically you have a mental model, you make a hypothesis, um, you plan the encoding and you encode the change and there's what's called a gulf of execution. So can I actually execute this thing? Um, do I have to type it in for 45 minutes? Um, do I have to like execute some really gnarly like wave gesture? Uh, that modifies the model. It reinterprets, re reinterprets the model into the artifact. So this would be like if I had a um, 
a pottery wheel that took a curve and turned that curve into a nicely modeled 3D object. Uh, that would be kind of that step. It presents that nicely modeled 3D object back to me. Uh, there's a gulf of evaluation, which is things like I look at that and I decide whether or not I like it, which is obvious for a pot, but maybe not so much for like a generative novel or especially generative games have a really bad issue with this. Like how long does it take us to evaluate a game? Um, possibly a while. The, the dissertation goes into uh, slow creators, which are creators that have a very slow evaluation or encoding loop um, and strategies to deal with that. And then we evaluate and we update our mental model like, oh, I see that it won't let me make something that is too wide to fall over. Um, I also made something during the course of this, uh, this dissertation that I'm calling the generative framework of generativity. Um, and this is basically uh, my framework of generativity uh, to add to all the ones that came before that saying that generative pipelines are made out of individual generative methods. Um, if anybody doesn't have a deck of generominoes, I will happily give you one. Um, but this, uh, the generominoes were a deck of cards that I made to reify this idea into physical uh, cards that represented each kind of generative method. And then you could build long, complex pipelines out of those and then easily switch different cards in. Uh, and this was part of the argument of the generative framework of generativity is that you might have long chains of different steps. And then for each step, you might be able to say, well, what if the evaluation was being done by uh, an AI? Uh, what if it was being done by a human? What if it was being done by your Twitter feed? Um, you know, the, somebody is interacting. Well, what if it was a tree branch that's interacting? What if it's an animal that's interacting? What if it's strangers that are interacting? And you can kind of socket these in and out. Um, it's a, it's, and then, you know, even mid-steps can like involve interaction in some way. Uh, and so it's the idea that there is no sort of black, bo black box into which you like, put humans and outcomes art, and that is what, inter what, that is what generativity is like. It's a constantly navigated field. Um, so that was the definition of a casual creator, if you followed along. And now I'd like to identify some uh, shared features. Um, and to do that, I'll show you a little bit about where I got these shared features from, the, the sort of artifacts or the systems that I examined for this. Um, a lot of them were on my own prototypes. Um, these were prototypes that were either mostly made for fun, but also to uh, explore unexplored parts of the design space. So often I would find two different generative methods or two patterns that I had identified. So L systems and genetic algorithms. Um, and then I would make something in that space. Uh, if, I, if I felt that these two would somehow taste well together, I would make my generative cocktail of those two patterns and drink it and see what it tasted like. Um, as an evaluation, this is very low rigor, but it was very high volume. Uh, so I did a lot of these and I was able to, at least for my own personal satisfaction, identify patterns that I felt were true in them. Um, so you can see for each one of these, there are a couple of different patterns. So Tiohana, which is like a little procedural dance generator, uh, had an extremely entertaining evaluation. Entertaining evaluations are one of my favorite patterns, um, but we're using the, gen uh, the um, generative method of music controlled particle systems and genetic algorithms. Um, something like bot print was actually fairly similar to that. It was built in the same engine, um, but it, it's using socketed grammars uh, instead of particle systems. Um, binary fission was an intervention into uh, a system that we were designing to figure out how to make something with a really gnarly grok loop. So the previous uh, version of this had had people um, typing in mathematical equations and then mentally evaluating them, which is very hard for humans to do both of those things. So this is how do you uh, turn that into basically like browsing through things and then hovering over them so you can uh, do this grok loop possibly you know a hundred times a minute or more. Um, and as you can see we've, I've just made a lot of these different things all of which approach a variety of different uh, different um, techniques and, and approaches. Um, I also made some where other people could make creative stuff in them uh, so things like techni, tracery, um, Chancery and the Generominoes are all, uh, I made a casual creator for the Generominoes, so you can design casual creators with your casual creator. Mm -hmm. um, and Techni makes generative systems in a generative system. Um, so these are sort of meta ones, but that I still applied with some degree of success all these patterns. Um, but honestly, I've just made a ton of different prototypes, just so many different <laughs> prototypes for different things. Um, this is a recent one. Um, and so, yeah, again, we're looking at uh, low rigor, high volume, and discovering and excavating patterns in these. Uh, I also looked at a ton of existing systems, and this was a really great dissertation for opening my mind to where to find new systems and 
how to catalog them. Uh, so I was looking at games, I was looking at things in the app store that weren't cataloged as games, I would look at photo editing apps, um, artworks, gallery artworks, uh, tech demos, um, so there are plenty of things that are academic explorations like Pick Breeder, Clockwork Muse, and Petals, uh, commercial things like um, the historical pinball construction set, uh, and TKO, which is a, a, a party game, uh, and then lots of like strange things that, are, that don't categorize easily, like the recipe dice where you roll dice to come up with a new chili recipe, um, and Parable of the Polygons, which is an interactive essay. So yeah, that was um, what I looked at to find these. So now let's actually talk about you know, what casual creators do, like what are the patterns that I've discovered in these. Um, as I mentioned before, one of our big sort of motifs that we'll see over and over again is that they exchange control for power. Uh, so you have less exact control, but you can do something faster. Um, aside from the pottery wheel, another really great example of an analog version of this is Spirograph. Has anybody not played with a Spirograph? So most people played with them at least once as a, as a kid. Um, you stick a pen into a gear and then you crank it around some number of times. There are two intersecting gears and you crank that around some number of times. And it is, you are providing the gesture, but it is scaffolding your gesture such that even like a six-year-old kid can make a beautifully mathematical pattern. Uh, it was originally sold as, or uh, pitched as a toy for mathematicians in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these things have bizarre histories. Um, and so I'm giving up control. I can't draw anything. I'm not drawing Garfield with a spirograph unless I'm an extremely virtuosic spirograph user. Um, mm -hmm. But I, with very little effort, I can make a couple of choices that still feel creative. So if spirograph only came with two gears and one pen, it would not be much of a casual creator. My, my possibility space would be very narrow. But instead, it comes with several pens, several gears. Um, they actually publish some recipe books of different algorithms that you could run on your spirograph to have different behaviors like okay start do one of these and then find one of the points move the thing to the point and then like do it again and you get sort of interesting spirals um, and so you have a possibility space to find by that generative pipeline uh, the possibility spaces I found were actually fairly uh, fascinating uh, there were a couple of um, terrible attempts that I made to uh, illustrate different forms of possibility space but most possibility spaces are so complex that you can't easily diagram them um, uh, they would often contain lots of different kinds of artifacts or different what I call textures of artifacts. So sometimes you would get something um, like on the left here where, okay, there's <coughs> some exceptional artifacts, some good ones, some bad ones, and a couple of broken ones. Um, you might want get some where uh, everything is either good or bad, nothing is exceptional, and nothing is broken. Um, and you might even get something where like there's a whole bunch of broken stuff and then maybe one exceptional thing. So you often get some possibility spaces that are full of garbage and one or two diamonds. None of these possibility spaces are wrong to build a casual creator around. Um, some casual creators, uh, there was one that I, I found where you're just, um, it's like those sequin pillows and you just like move your fingers along the sequins to flip the sequins I've heard down. Um, nothing in that space is particularly interesting, uh, but you can move through it very safely. Um, you might also want that sort of space if you're making a game design, oh, like a level generator. Uh, none of the levels in Diablo are particularly spectacular, but they're very safe. Uh, you never get a broken one, which is very important for their game design. Um, for a very uh, spiky sort of possibility space where there's a lot of trash and only one or, one or two good things, you, can, you get a situation where people start searching uh, collaboratively for the one good thing, and you, become, you get interesting patterns where people could self-promote from finding good content. Uh, Dwarf Fortress is sort of an example of this, of a very spiky possibility space. Lots of trash and occasional grand epics uh, that you, you just have to sift far enough through. Um, so the shape of the possibility space is defined by the generative pipeline, um, and different types of possibility space co spaces create different, what I'm loosely calling genres of casual creators. So things like if I'm making a stroke, uh, or like my, my possibility space is a bunch of strokes, uh, a natural thing would be to make that as part of a drawing app, and then there are a lot of different things you can make with those strokes. So if you have, like, my possibility space is defined by a bag of strokes, that sockets very into, like, most of those are drawing tools in one way or another. Um, the clearest example of that is uh, parametric spaces. This is a space that you get if you have a bunch of numbers that are creating your artifact. Uh, so, like, imagine I have 10 sliders that are sliding back and forth, like, up on the top right. Um, 
There are a number of different projects, uh, mostly academic, that use this, uh, although it's hard to find out what commercial apps use. Um, so there are a bunch of different patterns that socket very well onto this. So you can create, um, if you if you have this n-dimensional, uh, if you have this parametric space, you can define this as an n-dimensional cube. If you have an n-dimensional cube, each point in it is a, an artifact, and then you can do goofy stuff like create landmark artifacts and populate around them. Um, sort of like this, I can say, I like that tree, give me a bunch of trees around that. Um, you can cluster or regionalize the artifact space, you can sample from a region, um, you can blend or evolve, so if I have this point and this point, then the line between them should contain a sort of blending from one artifact to another, depending on how smooth your space is, uh, if you don't have a lot of like sharp pops caused by if statements. Um, and you can like animate along a curve, like Funky Ikebana does, so you can like just kind of like smoothly transition from one to another. Um, and of course, uh, evolution, evolutionary algorithms work real nice in this space. Um, so now I'll move on to some of the other design patterns. So some of the design patterns are inherited from the shape of the possibility space, um, but other design patterns are more general purpose. So whether you had something that was represented by a genetic algorithm, um, sorry, a parametric space, or sort of a bag of curves, or whatever your model is, these all kind of apply equally. Um, and I'll go through some of these just because I, uh, on a very high level, because I, I think I have about 10 of them. Um, so some of these come straight out of creativity theory. So things like no blank slate. Um, people freeze up if they see a blank slate. Uh, obviously, if you have an expert user, you don't start Mozart off with like twinkle, twinkle, little star and ask him to start like manipulating it until it's something that he wants. That's a little weird. You don't open up Photoshop and see some smiling, happy family photo and you're supposed to edit that until it looks like your family. Um, but often... <laughs> Users do need, uh, this is the sort of, imp so a lot of this comes out of, um, I just kind of went through uh, Impro, which is the classic improvisation book um, that defined a lot of the things that we think of now as improv, and just went pattern by pattern, really. Uh, and one of the big patterns there is yes and, and also giving people sort of prompts. So this whole idea of like draw an idea out of a hat or um, theater games that have props. Uh, and so casual creators often do this um, themselves, but more often it's done by the community around casual creators. So Spore, we had uh, our community manager would have these holiday contests um, where, or contests where people would be encouraged to, you know, make a mailbox, make uh, a holiday scene, make a fruitcake. Um, and then other groups do this for various forms of creative activity, um, such as uh, the Quilt Today community on Facebook, which uh, gives you a photo and encourages you to make a quilt out of, or quilt design out of that photo. Um, so often these things are not running on the apps themselves, but are running kind of in back channels. Uh, they may even be disconnected from um, a casual creator. So you could have a casual creator for designing quilts that somebody uses for the Quilt a Day project. Um, there's also things about creative safety, and this is often things like uh, making impossible challenges such that no single person feels uh, left out. Um, in Pictionary, it's not, we're going to vote for which of our friends draws the best thing ever. Um, it's, I'm going to give you an impossible task and ask you to draw that. Cranium uh, is a game that takes that further, where it makes you sculpt it in clay or even draw it with your eyes closed, so really leveling this sort of thing. Um, and then also simple challenges like change a word memes, where like you just have to change one thing. You don't kind of have to do the heavy lifting. You just have to be clever. Um, possibility span space annotation. This is kind of a pattern for uh, big, weird, uh, mostly bad spaces or even spaces that, like, have a few, like where the exceptional artifacts are fairly rare. Um, and then users create communities around annotating things. There was, there are two competing um, scientific notations for describing your nomad sky creatures that you find uh, for people who pictures themselves as the Carl Linnaeus of a digital space and are trying to enforce proper space annotation for that. Um, there's, this sort of blends seamlessly into self-promotion, which is uh, if I'm annotating the space and I'm just documenting things, that doesn't feel like a sort of a source of pride for me, unless you're the sort of person who really likes to be the Carl Linnaeus. Um, but sometimes people find things and then uh, reproduce them in such a way, such as the boat murdered uh, legendary dwarf fortress playthrough, that be it becomes artwork and people are self-promoting through this uh, through that system. Um, there is a very strong pattern in casual creators of letting people auto self-promote with a button. Um, so things like Opus Magnum is a creator for making these weird little machines that uh, put, like basically do like a little casual game ball and socket thing, but you have to do it through a machine. And there is a, 
export to GIF, and I can't remember if there's like a post GIF to Twitter automatically button, um, but you are GIFifying a thing, that thing looks great on Twitter. If I make a clever thing, um, I post this to Twitter and all my friends say, oh, that thing is so clever. Ooh, what's Opus Magnum? Um, and so it is self-promoting the tool uh, through promoting the self. Um, even very small things like, um, so in this bottom right one, this is Alpha Bear, uh, where you can fill in a little template with the words that you found in this word search game. And here I am humble bragging that I found this funny, like, I found this funny thing, but also look, I found a really long word that was complex and you know that I can like find this word. Um, and here's a little link to Alpha Bear so you can get Alpha Bear. Um, this is a very like great pattern, especially for indies trying to get their name out. Um, there are a couple that are just about ways to make casual creators feel more magical. Um, what is, when I'm exchanging control for power, what is the power that I'm gaining? So repetition is like the first order version of this. Like repetition is a really strong casual creator pattern. If you do some input and repeat it, it looks cool. Uh, it feels magical. It's a thing that we can't normally do by ourselves. We can't copy <coughs> things indefinitely uh, with accuracy. Um, so there are a bunch, like Mirror Lab is probably the best one of these where you put in a photo and it does something extraordinarily fun with it. Uh, but there are also tessellation ones. Um, the one in the middle is transformation. This is a pretty loose pattern. It, I just couldn't find a better term for it. But this is when something is transformed in some way. So I, I wrote this chapter on casual, uh, on casual creators that intersect with coloring books in some way. So if you take the pipeline of a coloring book, I have I have some, re like some lines. There are regions in those lines. I color in those lines, and then I look at the picture. Any one of those can be... Any one of those steps can be transformed in some way. Well, okay, the, the, um, the, uh, I draw the lines and then the, the computer fills them in with a machine learned model of cats. Uh, so it's the computer is using the coloring book that I'm drawing for it. Um, or Sketch Aquarium is a nice one where uh, kids color in with actual physical crayons a, an image of a fish. It gets scanned in and that fish gets sort of zooped up to a physical screen on the wall as a three-dimensional swimming fish. So this is sort of like, I have made something normal um, in a casual way, and then it's gotten like sucked into a magical sphere. Uh, and then make it real is just, uh, we've got a lot of personal fabrication stuff, and it's really interesting to see where casual creators intersect with that um, and, and how they could kind of drive some of this, or some of this personal fabrication stuff that seems to be kind of tapering off or, or becoming ever more professionally locked. Um, signifiers add power and expressing identity are two ones that, about how casual creators intersect with our world. Um, so this is the, uh, the sheriff generator, if everyone has seen the sheriff meme. Um, this is basically just a signifier playground, and signifiers are a semiotics term for here's an object that means something outside of what it actually is. So if I put the poop emoji, like, we know what the poop emoji means. If I put the peach emoji, we know what the peach emoji means. Um, <laughs> And different, different signifiers will mean things to different uh, cultures. So this is the sheriff of please pass this dissertation. Uh, and this is a casual creator that somebody made of making your own uh, sheriff memes. So you can see this is something that everybody could approach. But uh, by making these small switches of signifiers, if I changed all these to fish, if I changed all these to poop emoji, um, I make different kinds of sheriffs, but just by very small signifier shifts. Um, there's also another pattern in kind of letting people express identity. So I've talked about how casual creators are about moving quickly through a possibility space. Well, what happens if the possibility space is a representation of identities? Remember that every possibility space leaves some stuff out and includes some stuff. So whose identities are getting left out? Uh, what identities are being left in? Um, kind of how do you combine these with different signifiers? And so there's a whole subgenre of casual creators where you represent yourself through the signifiers of some space. So uh, who are you in the Harry Potter universe? This is a very strong one of like the Hogwarts houses are strong signifiers and I can self-identify through these four signifiers and maybe a wand. Um, but there are things like uh, there was a little um, get out the vote casual creator where there are a variety of different political signifiers you can put in like a Black Lives Matter or a barfing eagle or like a uh, American flag background and then some signifiers that are about yourself. So I put glasses and pink hair. Uh, there is a Simpsonizer that is very sadly no longer with us. Um, but all of these let you sort of express yourself through the tools of, of this space. Um, it's also interesting of moving very quickly through an, a space of identity is a way that a lot of people play with either gender or presentation identities. Um, Haim has a really great example in one of his talks where he was making himself in the me maker, um, which is like 
uh, the Wii's personal creativity tool. Um, and he had a beard at the time, and he said, no matter how I like, changed my beard, it looks stupid. And he said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then he got rid of the beard. <laughs> um, I'd like to like, end with an example of one of my favorite patterns. This is entertaining evaluations. And this kind of just shows you the range of some of these patterns. Um, so these are a number of different tools, or a, a number of different systems that use entertaining evaluations in some ways. Sometimes it's uh, the evaluation itself. So there are a lot of pipelines that need evaluations in some way, like genetic algorithms, or just like um, in the one on the top left, these are the metagame, apples to apples, TKO, not shown, um, cards against humanity, where we are all making a little creative thing, and then we have to choose which the best creative thing is. And so we're going to do that with people. We're just going to have one person as the voter, and uh, this is referred to often as an apples-to-apples -apples mechanic. Um, you can also have things where uh, a computer is doing the evaluation, but you want it to do that evaluation in a fun way. And so uh, there are um, things like Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, where you get a nice little numerical excitement rating, an intensity rating, a nausea rating. Um, you could just have those numbers, but it also has tiny little people that wander around and will like puke if you're uh, <laughs> if it's too exciting. Um, the Sims, oddly enough, actually started off as an architecture generator. Um, this was supposed to just be a casual creator for architecture, and they put in little entertaining evaluation people that would comment on your house, and people got really excited about those, and that's why it's called The Sims and not The House. <laughs> um, and then there's something like Art School, which is actually using this entertaining evaluation as a critique of art education. Um, you are told at the beginning that you have a very smart professor who is going to evaluate all of your work, and that they've been trained on all the greatest art in the world. So this is kind of playing into this idea of uh, machine learn, the current gestalt of machine learning being trained on classical art and being able to solve art. Um, and you um, doodle with a terrible little interface uh, and then it will arbitrarily rate it. It is very clearly completely random. And so this is uh, also playing into the safety uh, pattern again of if you make an impossible task, people don't feel bad about failing at it. It's actually fun to fail if your task is impossible enough. You don't take it personally. Uh, so this is making an excitingly safe space to play with, but also a critique of what it means to evaluate art. Um, so that's that. Uh, we're getting very near to the end. Um, so these were my research questions again, and you can kind of think to yourself, you know, did I define what a casual creator is and talk about the new experiences that we get with it? Um, the, like, are people creating mailboxes uh, in non-casual creator experiences? Um, does that, do our existing theories of creativity, everything from impro to uh, Csikszentmihalyi's uh, theories of creativity, predict any of the things that we've seen so far? Um, do you feel like these frameworks, especially the generative framework of generativity and this sort of grok loop, help uh, understand what's going on in some of these creators? Um, maybe not from this talk, but especially for, for some of my, like, excuse me, slow generator uh, chapters. Um, are there subcategories? I didn't talk about these as much, but you'll see these more in the dissertation itself. Um, what set of design patterns provide prescriptive guidance for designing new set successful casual creators? Like if you were to build a teapot generator or think about your work that you're doing right now, if you were to make that a casual creator. I know for the murder mystery project, we've used the, um, the metaphor of like, what if bad news, but a casual creator. Um, uh, and then, you know, if, if I've shown you that menu of, of patterns that we just had, you can kind of pick and choose and hold them up and will this one go? Um, and if these design patterns are used, do they ease and improve the design process? Uh, and for the last one, um, I wanted to at least, uh, um, with Catherine's assistance, design some form of evaluation that wasn't just me in my own head. Uh, and so that I made this uh, zine that's on the table, Casual Creators. Um, some of the uh, patterns have shifted slightly that they don't seem to stay steady very easily. Um, but I had a tiny little study of seven industry professionals because it turns out they're very busy um, and asked them, you know, do you feel represented by this? Uh, does this feel like something that is relevant for your work? Um, especially, would you recommend this to a colleague or would you rec recommend this to a junior colleague, like a student? Um, and that was uh, fairly universal that they all would. Um, uh, a couple of them identified very strongly with the term casual creators, even if they had not heard the term before. Um, 
one of them said that she now considers their, or they now consider their work a casual creator. Um, one in particular, Simon Colton, is actually going, he leads a studio in England, um, and he is going back and labeling his entire academic career's work as casual creators. <laughs> not, not all of it, but all of his interactive stuff. Uh, and so he's like very aggressively being like, yeah, that was a casual creator, that was a casual creator, and his lab is like very heavily using this term moving forward. Um, so that's been a, a strong success. Um, and then I asked them which patterns they consider the most important. Um, and a lot of it was kind of the safety or emergent kind of patterns. Um, I think nobody used make it real just because nobody is using that yet in the particular group that I surveyed. Um, so yeah, a number of people are, are using this so far. Um, your grok loop is too slow is almost an entirely accurate uh, you can just have that printed on a card and hand it to students, and it's all. Uh, and I've done this with several contracting gigs as well. Um, so you know, your grok loop is too slow. Let's look at the diagram. Oh, your evaluation is too slow. Nope, your encoding is too slow. Uh, we're gonna solve that. Um, we also uh, evaluated the generominoes with uh, Eddie Melser, um, and that seemed to help students very effectively start to understand generativity as a pipeline and their their designs got much better so that was a sort of squishy version of the evaluation and there's a, like a little harder version of the evaluation and then also the generominoes are getting used in a wide range of different things um, you can now use them in virtual reality because they've been ported to tabletop simulator um, so yeah this is kind of leads into what is the casual creator future and my hope for the casual creator future is uh, like um, tracery getting ported, like the generominoes getting ported into tabletop simulator, this is the part where I start to hand it off to other people. Other people, I hope, will now start to carry the torch more. Um, I'd like there to be an online directory of casual creators, so I might at least make that and seed it with all the casual creators that I identified in my dissertation, or casual creatory things. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to find out what a casual creator cur class slash curriculum would look like. You know, if we taught it as, you know, 140, whichever one we have left, um, what would our curriculum be? What would we ask the students to make? Um, who would we bring in as guest speakers? Um, how, do you get, how do you get outside of games, uh, especially if you're teaching this in a games department? It'd be interesting to teach this in an art department and see what their perspective is, or actually teach in our music department, which has a very strong generative music component. Um, I would love to see some meetups and or workshops. I'm bad at organizing this sort of thing, uh, so this is where I'd hope that other people would uh, join in and um, we'll see. I would love to turn this dissertation into a basically a handbook uh, or like O'Reilly style, not MIT press style uh, that people could use to build and, and use these things. So yeah, in conclusion, casual creativity is important. We're not all Mozarts and that's okay. Um, Software-ish systems can augment or support casual creative creativity and casual creators are a real genre and we should make and study them. So thank you very much to my committee and I'll open it up to questions. Um, the problem is that you often find these tools and they are either very restrictive in a sense, you know, it's very easy to create one exactly mm -hmm. like your Brock loop, um, but then everyone looks the same. Well, every, every presentation looks the same and becomes kind of boring very quickly. Or it's like too hard and, and then nobody's actually using it, right? And so do you see this as sort of like, um, I mean, have people like from Microsoft and Apple approached you? And, along with PowerPoint? Uh, not yet, although I would say that um, if, if you've used Prezi, Prezi is an interesting approach to trying to make a casual creator uh, in some way, like like many casual creators, a casual creator in some way for making presentations where like the swoopy generative aspect of it is very fun, so you have sort of magical generative power. Um, I think the trouble is uh, a lot of these patterns only work when the activity is autotelic. Um, so if you have something that is being done for a particular purpose, so like I have a boss and I have to make this presentation for this boss, uh, or I have a grand idea and I have to make this presentation for this grand idea, uh, I need control. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these patterns sort of explicitly fight against control. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is often at odds with that. Uh, that said, there are a lot of systems where they successfully put these two things side by side. So Photoshop has a lot of very 
intense control over levels and pixel level. Um, but they also have a couple of doofy tools that are left in there kind of for playful use. So there's like the mosaic tool where you click it and it makes a terrible mosaic out of your image. Um, and so you could then like you make your terrible mosaic and then f f like fuss with it a little bit. So there's, there's some that successfully balanced modes back and forth. Um, and then another pattern that I see often is um, people outgrowing these casual creators. So you can make something for like little kids to basically make presentations online. Like, okay, do a few little drop stuff in, you're never going to get control. You wouldn't use this for like a business presentation, but it'll teach you the ropes. And then you outgrow that and you go into something else. Um, we had a uh, somebody that I followed on this poor creature creator that was one of our best creators, eventually outgrew it, got into uh, Maya, went to art school, and now works for Disney. That's a dog question. No, no dogs can actually use casual creators. Uh, I think rock loops would be very important for animal use as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, do you think is it would it be possible to have to take like a piece of software like Photoshop or I guess I'm curious like what your take is on really complex software that is not like a casual creator, but then using presets to like casual creator mm -hmm. uh software. Like, is that is that like a false casual creator that will lead you to low, or is that like? No, I think that's a really good place to start, and I think Instagram does a really good job of that. This idea, of like, let's have filters. So, what do most people want to do with their photos? They want to like, uh, you know, um, make it look good. Uh, and if they have like three buttons, like that little magic wand thing that they have for a lot of photo editing apps, like. I don't want to make a choice. I want my only choice to be like looks better or doesn't. Uh, or, you know, I'm going to uh, notice how a lot of these use signifiers where it's like different. Like I want to have a vintage photo. So I'm going to use the vintage signifier. So like photos, like photo filters as signifier. Um, you know, I'm going to use the like Hollywood one uh, or I'm going to put some stickers on this photo. Um, so I think uh, I haven't seen anything that blends that probably just because I haven't opened every photo app that exists on the App Store, uh, because there's thousands. Uh, th there's probably at least one that allows you to do these sort of like broad, casual, creatory gestures, um, and then allows you to do little like Photoshoppy fussiness. Um, often just because of the way that generativity works, you can't move from a less complex <coughs> model that uh, enables casual creativity to a more complex model that's like pixel to pixel and then move back. Um, Often it's difficult to do that, like sort of swapping back and forth layering. So I think that's one of the things that prevents prevents that from happening. Um, but you can usually do it unidirectionally of like photo filter, uh, two pixels, and then from pixels to uh, direct mix pixel manipulation. Yes. So I have a question from the internet. Ah. <coughs> Hello, internet. Um, I totally agree with the need for a fast grok loop. However, with musical instruments, a grok loop can go from very slow to fast after years of honing a skill, memory, learning mm -hmm. patterns. How does this framework account for long-term engagement slash learning difficult tools? Uh, long-term engagement slash learning difficult tools. Um, so a lot of these casual creators uh, unfold in different ways. Um, so if you've played an idle game where like your first, uh, if you open cookie clicker, there's exactly one thing you can do, which is click the cookie and then mm -hmm. UI unfolds out mm -hmm. as you've learned this more and more. Um, so for example, in the, uh, the um, pottery wheel app that I showed you, you start with just being able to shift the thing and then you can buy yourself more tools. And so this is great because it keeps people from getting kind of choice paralysis. Uh, it gives you a small number. Like if you don't know anything about the space, you're more okay than ever or than ever later uh, for having a restricted number of tools because you don't know the tools that should be in that space. And then the more you use that tool, the more fussy things you need to, like fussy tools you need. Um, so if you know any friends who are crafters, you know, you start off with like the little kid's paint kit for $1.50 and then pretty soon you're buying like different kinds of acrylic pouring things and like, uh, um, different drying medium and different like inclusions and different kinds of paints and not that blue, the other blue, no, not that blue. Um, so like you see people uh, when they get into these apps, if there are, if there are long-term casual creator apps, um, which I'm not sure, I have not seen many of them. Um, uh, a lot of times it's like people outgrowing the creature creator. Uh, sometimes people just really like something and become virtuosic in it. 
Uh, so the idea of becoming virtuosic in a casual creator is not uncommon. Um, this is kind of that self-promotion thing where you will get people, you know, we've all seen the like, you'll never guess what somebody made in an Etch-A-Sketch, and it's like a perfect mm -hmm. Mona Lisa. This is somebody taking a casual creator and self-promoting through virtuosic uh, expansion of what we thought the possibility space was. Um, so yeah, people, people expand the possibility space often in ways that the creator did not anticipate. Um, we didn't put in uh, asymmetry in this work creature creator. Um, somebody did a discovered a glitch that allowed you to do that and then uh, self-promoted by making a base model um, of, the, of the creature that had asymmetry, uploading that, and then anybody could download that and build asymmetric creatures without having to go through the glitch. Um, so this is kind of a, a virtuosic user expanding the possibility space in a way that was not sanctioned uh, by the original creators. Um, so I would say that that is often what we see. Um, you're like, oh, I'm sure there's there's sometimes in in music where it's like nobody thought to use a flute like that, but now everyone does. Um, so it, it'll be interesting. I think uh, I don't know that every casual creator. I don't know how many casual creators are long term casual creators, and I don't think that each one should. I think there are some things that it's it's totally okay, okay to have recorders, like the recorder in like an elementary school music class. That's fine. People outgrow it. It sounds terrible. Uh, they're cheap. They're they fulfill a space in our lives. Um, not everybody graduates from paint by numbers to like full on canvases, and that's okay too. Uh, it's okay to just be there for people in one stage because that stage might stay with people. We're not always just a stepping stone on the way to Mozart. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for maybe one more question. I've got another one from the internet. Yeah, sure. Um, the question is, has anyone made a casual creator within Minecraft, i.e. Insta House Builder or whatever? Um, I would assume yes. I'm not big enough in the Minecraft scene to know. Um, I would, I, I forget what people have hooked up to Minecraft, but basically anything that you can hook Python into, um, you can make a casual creator from. Or really anything that has any form of scripting. Um, so, heck, you could probably just build a Minecraft in Minecraft itself with, with enough redstone. <laughs> like, somebody should make a Minecraft pottery wheel. I think that would be a nice challenge. <laughs> I'm going to call a one minute bio break. Okay, yeah, Feel free to um, grab snacks on your way out, otherwise, it'll just end up in the ice lab. Oh, thank you. You should probably stop streaming, though. Oh, yes. Thank you, Internet. Yeah, thanks, Internet. <laughs>